So <laughs> we, our first essay is a compare and contrast essay. And uh, I want to go over the instructions. I'm going to paste this in the Google Classroom so that you can have it. Uh, but I'm going to go over the instructions for you um, today just to give you a heads up on where we're going and what you should be thinking about um, through this first uh, four lectures so that you have an idea of what you're doing. Um, and then I'm going to look at the overall structure of an essay so that you get a sense of what a compare and contrast essay, how, how it's organized and um, what sort of will go into it. So uh, without further ado, uh, this is the assignment. It's uh, molded on an assignment that you would get in a traditional high school class. Um, I molded it off of uh, some of the English, ninth grade English assignments that I, I use in my classroom. So um, read these instructions first. These instructions are stable with all the essays that I would give out in a high school environment um, through all the grade levels pretty much, uh, except that they're you know just a little bit tweaked to be for a compare and contrast essay. Create an organized essay with an introduction that includes a thesis statement. We'll go over what that is. A minimum of three body paragraphs. We'll go over what those are and a conclusion. Um, that's exactly what it sounds like. Uh, the body paragraphs should each include a minimum of one direct quotation or paraphrase of a reliable research source. Next week, we're going to talk about what is a reliable research source and how to do research. Uh, so hold your thought on that. Uh, we all know what a direct quotation is. A paraphrase is, let's say you read a paragraph that's chock full of a bunch of data and information, and you want to use that information, those dates or whatever, but you don't want to quote the whole paragraph. You could just pull the dates and the data out and use them in your writing. But at the end of it, because they're not your information, you have to tell the reader where that information came from. Uh, so that'd be a paraphrase uh, to put it in your own words. After the direct quotation or paraphrase, you need to cite your sources within parentheses. It's called parenthetical citation. Again, when we do research next week, we'll talk about how to cite your research. Uh, following your conclusion, list your sources on a works cited page that is an MLA formatting. Again, when we talk about research next week, we're going to look at research. We're going to look at how to do quotations, how to do paraphrases. We're going to look at how to cite your sources. We're going to look at how to write a works cited page. Um, different. Th there are these things called formats. And um, different, I don't want to say genres, different um, fields of study format their sources in different ways, but it's standard throughout that field of st study. Like there's a psychology association one, um, you know, there's, there's a science way to do it. There's an English way to do it. I know the English way to do it, so we're going to do the English way to do it here. Uh, so it's called MLA formatting. That's Modern Language Association formatting. And they produce a book called the MLA Handbook. You don't need to buy it. We can find all this stuff online. They, actually, there's a great little website source called easybib.com that will help you do all of this. And we'll, we'll talk about that next time. Um, so anyway, don't worry. We'll go over all of that before you start writing. Uh, I prefer that you start submit this as a word process document. You can do that in the classroom. You write it in Google Docs and then you submit it or you can write it in Word and submit it to the classroom and I can read it that way and, and give you feedback like on the paper itself. However, I know that not everybody has equal access to um, computers and, you know, word processing skills. So um, if you want, you can handwrite it legibly. I need to be able to read it online paper and submit pictures, pictures that I can read uh, of your work. And then I can I can grade it using the pictures that way. Uh, and when I say grade, I really mean assess. I, I wasn't planning on putting grades on papers, but if you prefer to have a grade on your paper or if your parents prefer you to have a grade on your paper, that's fine. I can I can do that. I, I have a rubric and uh, I can calculate a grade on it. I was just going to use a rubric without a grade. Uh, anyway, you are reminded of the need for proper English grammar and clear presentation in your answers. And that's that's pretty straightforward. So again, when you look at the instructions, it's got to be an organized essay. It's got to have an introduction and a thesis statement at the end of the introduction. It's got to have three body paragraphs. Each body paragraph has to have quotation in or paraphrase inside of it. It's got to have a conclusion and it's got to have a works cited page. Those are the criteria that you need in your paper. And it's all right here in the instructions. Um, then we have the actual topic of the essay. Essay number one, compare and contrast. A compare and contrast essay is one that provides points of comparison between two subjects. That's, that's what it sounds like, right? You're going to compare things and then you're going to contrast. You're going to see how they're the same 
you're going to see how they're different. And that's that's the topic of the essay. Uh, it generally explores similarities and differences of these subjects. The essay is structured in body paragraphs that describe the two subjects and concludes with a final analysis. So basically, you've got a minimum of three body paragraphs. You can have more than that. But let's assume you're going to have three. Um, you're going to organize your essay in such a way that you're going to look at ways things are similar and ways things are different. Uh, so I've given you some options uh, to choose from that we're going to be looking at the North and the South. Obviously, we got these two poles, right? The Union and the Confederacy, the North and the South, the blue and the gray, whatever you want to call them. And um, we're going to compare and contrast them. But you can't, we're not just going to write a compare and contrast essay on the two sides. I mean, like that's that's volumes of history books that you could write on that. We're going to pick one topic and then we're going to look at those two sides. And that's what your essay is going to be about. So here are some in alphabetical order that I, I came up with. Culture. You could look at the culture of the Union versus the culture of the Confederacy. Um, and you could write a, a paper about culture. Demographics. Demographics are like population information. Um, you could look at the demographics, uh, you know, of the North versus the South and study that. The census of 1860 would be a really great source on that because it provides a lot of demographic information. And then you'd be doing a little bit of a statistical analysis on um, the demographics of the two sides. And, and you're going to come to some sort of a logical conclusion. So you would you would look at those demographics, and at the end, you would make some sort of claim about the war um, based on that. Economy. You could take a look at, obviously, we have uh, two parts of the same country that are splitting, and their economies are very, very different. So you'd look at the economics of the North and the economics of the South and do an analysis there. Industry. That's tied in with economy, but it's a very specific um and different thing because industry is responsible for producing things like railroads and cannons and warships and, and things like that. All of these things that come out of factories um, and are, are built to service the war machine. So there would be, whereas the economy is more about money, industry is more about production of goods. Infrastructure, that would be things like roads and canals and railroads and uh, all of that kind of bridges, you know, like you could you could look into whose infrastructure, infrastructure is important in warfare because the side that has the better ability to deliver goods to the front or to deliver troops to the front or to supply troops at the front, um, they end up with more um, advantages. And so you could look at the infrastructure of the North versus the infrastructure of the South. Um, the military, that one's pretty straightforward. You know, you're looking at armies, navies, um, you know, the actual number of artillery pieces, you know, those sorts of things. And you do a compare and contrast between the two sides there. Uh, military leadership, that's another, uh, it's a its a branch of military, but it's, it's sort of separate. We're not looking at the actual uh, materials. We're not looking at the actual soldiers. We're looking at the generals. Let's take a look at the two sides and see um, how the generals compare and contrast with each other, how the, how the leadership works. Uh, political leadership. I mean, most people know about Abraham Lincoln, um, but let's take a look at the general political leadership of the Union versus Jefferson Davis and the political leadership of the Confederacy. And then we can look at resources, natural resources, whatever they happen to be, um, gunpowder, iron, um, you know, what what things are the resources for each side and how do they compare and contrast? So I also put a little star down here. You may choose something else, but be sure to clear it with me via email. I just want to make sure that it's something that you could write a successful compare and contrast paper about. Um, and just so if you have another idea and it's something you want to do, you can you can write it to me. I do want to say here down at the bottom, I don't want to read repeat papers. I don't want everybody writing a military paper. I don't want everybody writing an industry paper. Uh, so. Once a student has emailed me to select one of these topics, I'm going to remove it from the list. I'll just come on this document and I will put a strike through in it and it will, you know, be no longer available. Uh, so it's going to be first come and first serve based on when the email arrives in my inbox. So if two of you jump on board and write me and say, hey, I want to do military leadership, uh, whichever one came into my inbox first is the one that's going to get it. And then I'll write the other person and say, hey, that was already taken. Sorry. Um, so that's just an FYI. Um, if you want to send me one and, and list your top two or top three, just so you get a second choice, you can do that as well. It doesn't bother me at all. But um, these are your topics. Uh, you're going to pick one, and then we'll talk about how to go off and do the research um, next time and then stuff like that. But uh, one thing that I think is helpful to you as you think about what your paper is going to be and as you start to do your research, because you have a whole week 
Uh, and those of you who are ambitious, you can you can start doing a little bit of research. You can start, um, you know, reading or you can start watching some documentaries. Um, we'll talk about how to do a timestamp quotation if that's what you want to do. Um, and, and gaining information. So um, your paper is basically this is I, I'm a visual guy. I like to see a visual representation of how the paper is going to work out. Um, and so your paper's in essentially five parts. You can have more body paragraphs or a few. Well, you can't have fewer. I'm, I'm making it a minimum of five paragraphs. But every paper has an introduction and a conclusion. And so an introduction is sort of an inverse pyramid in shape. Think of it as a funnel. Um, an introduction is going to start out with a lot of general information to let your reader know what the topic is. Um, and that information is going to get slowly more specific until you get down to this thing at the end of the introduction, which is called a thesis statement. Um, the thesis statement is the point you are going to make. It is the answer to the question that your paper asks. And um, we'll talk about thesis statements as time moves on. It's hard to write one without your research, having your research done. So we're not going to do that until we get the research under our belt. Um, but an introduction introduces a topic. That's why it's called an introduction. Uh, it starts broad and it becomes more specific. It begins with what's called a hook. Um, it's a fishing analogy or a fishing metaphor. You want to hook your readers. Uh, so if you go to a newspaper, if you go to a magazine, you'll find that the first paragraph of any story gives you a lot of basic information. Basically, the, the uh, writer is responsible for letting the reader know what the essay is going to be about so that the reader can make a choice as to whether they want to read the rest of the article or the story or the essay or whatever it happens to be. Uh, so you provide enough information for the reader to make a decision after reading only one paragraph. So they don't have to read the whole thing to find out. There should be no mysteries in academic papers. Uh, you should tell people what they're going to read in the first paragraph so they can make that decision. It's the accepted format, but it's also the kind of responsible thing to do as a writer. Uh, so you want to hook them. You want to get them with some sort of interesting fact or, or some idea or some sort of a bold statement or something. And we'll talk more about hooks when we get into the introduction. Uh, once you do that, you're going to move on to a second sentence, uh, which is general information about the historical event, in this case, the Civil War. You want to let us know this is a Civil War paper. Um, then you're going to move on to specific information about the topic within the historical event. All right, so maybe we're going to write about um, the culture, and you might say something about the you know, the culture of the North and the culture of the South, right? And then specific information about the two sides of the topic. Um, you might you might have sentence three be sort of the ways that they're similar. Um, you know, they all come from uh, the 13 colonies. They all fought together against Britain to gain their freedom. You know, like there, there are things that are, and then, you know, you could look at maybe some of the ways are different in the fourth one. Then you have to have your thesis statement. This is what makes a defensible claim and provides an outline of support. So I don't want to tell you what your argument is going to be, but if you were going to argue that the cultural differences between the two sides made this, this conflict of the Civil War inevitable, that would be your claim, right? Or if you were writing about, I don't know, the militaries and your claim was that given the disparity in size of the two militaries at the outset of the war, the uh, outcome of the war was an inevitability. Like there's lots of ways to structure what it is you want to say, but you got to make some sort of a claim and it's got to be a defensible claim, something that you can prove using your research, using your facts, and then you're going to provide an outline for support. So generally a thesis statement, and we'll do this again when we when we talk specifically about the thesis statement, but it would say this because of this, which teaches this, right? So the first one is your claim. Your second one is sort of um, the support you're going to use in your body paragraphs. And the third one is what we call your so what element. Um, you're making um, you're you're making your paper matter. You know why why people are interested in reading it. Um, so we'll we'll talk more about that. Then you've got three body paragraphs, and each body paragraph has the same structure. The structure repeats. The topic changes. So you have uh, a body paragraph always starts with what we call an assertion. It's it's kind of like a mini thesis statement for your body paragraph. It's you're making a claim, but it's a limited claim. Your claim is is going to prove part of your big statement up here. So you'd start with an assertion. Um, so let's say, I don't know, I'm I'm writing a paper about the militaries of the two sides. And my first body paragraph is about 
infantry, uh, right? And so I would say something like, I can't, I can't write it without having done the research, but I'd say something like um, the relative disparity in size um, of infantry greatly favored the Union Army, right? You know, something like that. Uh, and that would be my claim. Then we're going to provide historical context and details to help the reader place the quotation. So you will have found your quotations, you'll find your paraphrases, whatever it is you're going to use as statistics to back this up. And we're going to give historical context to this. Like, for example, the, the Union had an established army and military prior to the breakout of the Civil War, whereas the Confederacy had to develop one on the fly. Um, and this led to a disparity in sizes, you know, like, I don't know, I just made that up off the top of my head. I haven't done any of the research. But you, you'd you provide that sort of historical context, and then you'd go into a quotation, you'd, you'd introduce your source, according to WH somebody, author of this awesome book about Civil War history, and then you put your quotation in there, and you have your citation. Um, then you're going to explain the relevance of the quotation to the claim that you made in your assertion. Um, and that's pretty straightforward. And then a lot of really good essays have more than one quotation or paraphrase per body paragraph, especially compare and contrast papers, because you're looking at the North, you're looking at the South. You may want to have a quote or a paraphrase from a source about the Northern bit and then a quote or a paraphrase about the southern bit right and so those would unify into your body paragraph so you know each body paragraph could be about the north and the south and some aspect like some aspect of culture or some aspect of industry that way you find three aspects of industry or three aspects of culture and you analyze them uh, another way to structure this would be to have a body paragraph in which you talk entirely about the military of the north and then you talk entirely about the military of the South. And then in your third body paragraph, you do the compare and contrast. It might be better actually in a four paragraph model where you talk about the entire military of the North, the entire military of the South, the ways they're similar, and then add a fourth body paragraph, the ways they're different. Um, so you just need to come up with a logical organization for how you're gonna put this essay together, um, plan it out, and make sure that each of your body paragraphs follows this sort of model. At the end of your body paragraph, I put this T in here, which is a transition. Um, it's just a quick little um, move to the next paragraph. So say if your first body paragraph was about the union and you talked all about the union, then at the beginning of your next body paragraph, you might transition with a phrase like, in contrast. You know, like, in contrast, the Southern Army was, like, it's just a couple of words, but if you don't do it, your essay doesn't flow together, and that's something that we can work on and improve um, as time goes on. But your essay is going to end with a conclusion. Uh, a conclusion has the opposite structure of an introduction. It's going to start out very specific. You're actually going to repeat your thesis statement. You're, you're going to rephrase it. Nobody wants to read it all over again. But for whatever reason, um, I find that a lot of students... Uh, of the high school age, they tend to write a conclusion that's essentially just a restatement of their introduction. Don't. We read your introduction. We read it three paragraphs ago. We have not forgotten what was there. If you're going to write a conclusion, you have to say something new. If you don't, it's a waste of your reader's time. So you're going to start specific and become broad. You're going to begin with a restatement of the thesis. Again, don't say it exactly the same way. Change up the sentence structure, reorder it a little bit. Um, but then you're going to end with what we call an analytical conclusion. So if it's a five-sentence model, and it doesn't have to be, but if it's a five-sentence model, your first sentence is a restatement of the thesis. Um, sentences two and three are going to draw conclusions from the above information. What can we conclude? You know, you probably had a claim in your thesis. Now you're going to reinforce it. You know, given the disparity in size between this and that or whatever, um, the conclusion of the civil war was an inevitability that would be sentence one and then you'd you know use a little bit more information for a second sentence and then you have two more sentences and you might want to look at those conclusions in relation to the larger world or their impact on the future or the lesson to be drawn out of them or whatever this is what we call a so what element how do we take this this research this this essay that you've written and apply it to something bigger than the essay itself what can we gain from it uh, and learn from it. You know, how does how does the cultural difference between the North and the South still exist today? Uh, 
how do the demographic differences, uh, you know, still exist today? What do we learn about um, conflicts between nations of relatively different sizes through the civil? I don't know. Like there's there's lots of things that you can come up with, but your responsibility in the conclusion is going to be looking beyond the the narrow confines of the essay and trying to broaden it out again. So you're going to start out very specific and you're going to move to general and it has a sort of opposite um, function. So it's it's sort of like a prism. You're going to draw your reader in. You're going to separate the points into like the various, you know, bands of light and then you're going to shoot them back out again in a broad spectrum. And that is the structure of an essay. All right. I'm going to stop this lecture, uh, but hopefully that gives you something to think about. Again, do not forget uh, that you want to pick a topic and email me with that topic. Do it through Classroom. Or that's that's perfectly fine. You, you go ahead and get on this Google Classroom and um, you know, I'll make it a I'll make it an assignment and you can do it right in the assignment, you know, pick an essay and that would be fine. All right. If you have any questions, shoot me an email as well. I'm I'm always available. You're also welcome to to talk to your facilitators in the classroom that you're in. Thank you.